Good morning, family. All right, I don't know about you, but I'm ready. So I am inviting you to stand as we sing our anthem for the month. And the reason why I say that is because uh, the song is We Believe for It. And if that's the case, then we certainly want to uh, understand that not on, it's all about Jesus, first of all. It's all about Jesus. And it's not only that we want to see him revealed around us, but we also want to see him revealed in us. And that happens when we believe. to celebrating 
baptism. As, uh, as uh, the, the first Sunday when we had a business meeting, and Jody O'Day had uh, completed her uh, Discover class, that uh, the, the need for baptism by immersion was uh, required to complete all of that. Oh, I tell you, I had a, a wonderful time with her this week, listening to her testimony and what God is doing uh, in a great and mighty way. So let's uh, support and celebrate uh, what God is doing in Jody O'Day's life. I told you I'd be a little bit uh, out of the saddle this week, so... As when Judy and I were away on our vacation, it was a privilege for me to be able to lean on my brother Jim, and I do so again today in the baptism waters. I've had asked him to, uh, to fulfill this uh, function here. So hello, there we go. We got the lights, so I turn it over to them right now. If you haven't met Jody yet, this is Jody O'Day. It is my privilege to baptize her today upon her profession of faith. So, Jody, I understand you have a profession of faith that you'd like to make. Yes, Jesus Christ is my Lord and Savior. Amen. 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 On the basis of your profession of faith, it is my privilege to baptize you, my sister, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. You are buried with Christ in baptism. And raised up to walk in new life. Praise God. Praise God. Isn't that a beautiful thing? Amen. Before I, I go any further, as, as Jody was sharing, Jesus is my Lord and Savior. The trembling in her voice was what I got to experience on Monday. It is uh, about your first love. It's about your first love. And, and, and that is 100% for real, what Jesus means to, to Jody. So I hope that that's a, a good time for us to reflect back and think about our first love. And, uh, and what a way to begin a time of worshiping our Lord and Savior. Well, welcome, everybody. What a beautiful day it is. I'm seeing some new folks today for the first time. Some, uh, some I was going to say some old folks, but some folks I haven't seen in a while. And what a time to celebrate today. If you are our guest for the first time, we uh, certainly are glad that you are here. We welcome you with a warm welcome uh, and open arms. And so uh, we're glad that you are here. We do ask our first time guests or someone who has not been or has been with us for a while and not connected with us that we take that first step on what we call the connection card. You'll see it in the pocket of the seat right in front of you. Uh, we invite you to take a few moments during the service to fill out a few things about yourself. And then at the end of the service, uh, Take the connection card to the connection center and there's somebody there with a big old smiling face to, to take this and to give you a gift of appreciation because we appreciate that you have come to worship with us uh, today. I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time in your bulletin mostly because I don't ha seem to have enough fingers to get through this. <laughs> But would you please notice, if you open up your bulletin, there is a listening guide. Uh, last week, we were on page 711, if you're using the Church Pew Bible. And, uh, and if you did not bring a Bible, please, uh, I invite you to use that. It's a different translation, but it is God's holy word. But open up your Bibles to Mark, Matthew, uh, Mark. Uh, and uh, tuck it into chapter 6. We're going to be looking at verses 14 to 29 today. And, um, and I also want to uh, draw your attention to uh, the part called looking ahead on the first page. 
The first thing that's there is something that is scheduled nationwide for, uh, uh, for this Wednesday, September 20. Two. It's called See You at the Poll. And what happens on that day is, is that Christians gather around the flagpole of their local school and they pray for that school. Well, as you well know, our mission field is a school. It's an elementary school, Central Ridge Elementary School. So, um, but the thing of it is, is, is that with the startup of school being so recently, we're having a little bit of a hard time coordinating with them and exactly time. So the, so what I want to ask you to do is right now, if you get set aside a time Wednesday morning, we will communicate to you by email. And if you do not have, if we do not have your email address and you want to be a part of that communication, get your connection card out and at least get your name, phone number, and an email address. But we're going to continue to pursue uh, a coordination with the school to be able to invite them to be a part of that prayer as well. And when we have that, I'll send it out to you. In the meantime, for well over a year now, we have been meeting right here in this spot every Monday morning at 930. So I encourage you, we're still going to pray. There's much about what God is doing in and around the circumstances that we face every single day. The schools are facing still a, a COVID situation. What is going to be their policies? So we must be patient about it. But we're going to trust in the Lord to open up those doors. So join us for prayer uh, either Monday or Wednesday or both if you can. The rest I'm going to lead, leave up to you. Uh, to, to read, to get familiar with. I do still want to remind you that coming up in October is the Leslie Hale Teaching Center tour. It's a bus tour going down to this fabulous uh, tabernacle on display. And so you want to see Elaine or, or sign up for that if that is something that you want to know more about. I'm going to leave it there and ask that you join me in prayer as we are preparing our hearts for worship. Um, you may be surprised, and maybe you won't be, as to where I'm going to take this passage of Scripture today. It's an interesting passage of Scripture. But let me just say, for this time, for these times that we are in, it is the most appropriate message that we all need to hear, no matter where we are in our walk with the Lord, in our relationship with him. So it is a time that as uh, this wonderful worship team leads us in singing praises to the Lord, that we have our hearts properly prepared to worship him. So let's, let's gather together in the presence of God in his throne room of grace. Father, we give you thanks and praise this morning that you have invited us we are privileged to come into your presence, recognizing that we are uh, sinful beings who do not deserve to be in the presence of your holiness. But it is because of an act of love and grace. Our Lord and Savior went to a cross, shed his blood, his perfect sinless blood to pay our sin debt we do not deserve your love nor your grace but because of how much you loved us we are invited to come in and the mighty work of our lord and savior jesus christ enabled that to happen Lord, I pray that as we think about how powerful our salvation is, how powerful your love is that enabled that salvation to, to take place, we hear the trembling in Jody's voice as she proudly proclaimed that Jesus Christ is my Lord and Savior, that you would find us trembling in your presence right down to our socks. Oh, Lord, what a privilege. Help us never to take it for granted. 
Help us to remember the people in faraway lands that are persecuted because it is against the law to worship you in that land. Oh, how privileged we are. And so, Lord, with gladness in our hearts, I hope you hear our praises all the way up into your heavenly throne because we're so grateful to be able to gather publicly. Lord, hear our, our sins confess to you as we repent, turn from our sin and turn to you. Lord, it is all about you. It's all about Jesus. May the name of Jesus be exalted and glorified. And in that perfect name we pray. Amen. 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 Worship team, please continue to lead us. As we continue to worship the God we love, let us join the angels in heaven in welcoming Jody into the kingdom of heaven here on earth and also to the family here at the First Baptist Church of Beverly Hills. Amen. How many of you know that there is wonder working power in the blood? Stand and join us as we testify to that truth. Would you be free from your burden of sin? There's power in the blood, power in the blood. Would you or evil a victory win? There's wonderful power in the blood. Service for Jesus, your King. There's power in the blood, power in the blood. Would you live daily His praises to sing? There's wonderful power in the blood. There is power, power, wonder working power in the blood of the Lamb. There is power, power, wonder working power. in power. Power in your name. The name of Jesus. Where every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that he indeed is Lord. You're the only answer to the darkness. You're the only right among the wrong. 
You're the only hope among the chaos. You are the voice that calls me on. Louder than every lie, my sword in every fight. The truth will chase away the night. Your name is power over darkness, freedom. For the captives, mercy for the broken and the hopeless. Your name is faithful in the battle, glory in the struggle, mighty. It won't let us down or fail us. Your name is power. Your name is power. Hope is certain. I know that the word will never fail. I know that in every situation, you speak the power to prevail. Louder than every lie, my sword in every fight, the truth will chase away the night. Your name is power over darkness, freedom for the captives, mercy for the broken and the hopeless. Your name is faithful in the battle, glory in the struggle, mighty, it won't let us down or fail us, cause your name is power over darkness, your name is power. Light arrives and heaven opens. Holy Spirit, let us hear it. When you speak, the church awakens. We believe the change is coming. Holy Spirit, let us see it. When you speak, the scattered darkness. Light arrives and heaven opens. Holy Spirit, let us hear it. When you speak, the church awakens. We believe the change is coming. Holy Spirit, let us see it. Your name is power over darkness. Freedom for the captives. Mercy for the broken and the hopeless. Your name is faithful in the battle. Glory in the struggle. Your name is power over darkness. Your name is power in the chaos. Your name is power in the struggle. Your name is power. Amen. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, your name is power in the chaos. Your name is power in the struggle. Your name is power over darkness. And for this, we give you praise. We thank you, God, for the opportunity to be reminded of just how good a God you are. For your loving power keeps us sustains us, and grows us in your word as we receive the love that you so freely give to those who will receive Christ and the work that he did on the cross. So we thank you, God, for salvation. We thank you for this opportunity to assemble ourselves and to glorify you, to magnify the praise with every voice and every heart that's here today, Lord. So we ask, Father, as we assemble and sing these songs, our minds are engaged. But today, Lord, I'm asking that as this word comes, that you would engage our hearts. Because it's the heart that truly leads us into the righteousness of your love. 
Father, we understand that your ways are not our ways and your thoughts are not our thoughts. And that's why we ask today, Lord, that you would allow your thoughts to be heard with our hearts. Where you have given us by the power of the Holy Spirit, the power to respond, to live, to obey, to worship, to testify, and to share the gospel of Christ. And for this, we praise you today, Lord. We thank you. As our pastor comes, we ask that you would continue to be with him. Lord, I ask that for a moment that you would just grab any discomfort he might have and just hold it in your hand for a while as he brings glory to your name with the word that he's brought today, Father. We ask this in Jesus' name, and we're happy to receive your love, and we're happy to receive your word this day because we acknowledge, God, that it's your power it's all about Jesus, and we thank you for Jesus. And it's in his name we pray and do believe. Amen. 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 Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Lenny and Sheila, helping this old cripple out. I appreciate it. And thank you for that uh, prayer too, Yvette. But Judy reminds me, you're never in pain when you preach. So uh, and there's a lot of times I come up here wounded and broken and so forth. But God is, is, uh, is good. Uh, all, the all the time. Amen. Well, uh, friends, last week we... Uh, opened up Mark uh, chapter 6 to, uh, to learn just how strong the rejection was of Jesus' uh, uh, gospel message and, and his, uh, to his own neighbors in Nazareth. What, anyway, these, these folks in Nazareth had known Jesus his entire life, and yet they were offended not only by his message, but by the miraculous works that he had performed that literally healed and, and changed people's lives. And Jesus had attempted to teach them once before, but was no more successful with them this time than he was the first. Their hearts were so hardened with unbelief, it was like the hard-packed soil of a road surface where the, the seed of truth could never be able to penetrate, even if it were cast by the Messiah himself. It was important for Jesus to show his 12 disciples this response to the gospel preached, for he was... Uh, he was training them. He was uh, preparing them to send them out to do the same. And church family, just like he does with us, to be able to preach that message of repentance that leads to salvation and the assurance of an eternal home with God. And that was a amen moment, okay? But Jesus knew that their message would be rejected by some. It always has been. It always will be. And some hearts are receptive to God's truth about who Jesus is. Some never will be. Some people would invite Jesus' disciples into their home when they would go out and preach the message because they wanted to know who Jesus is. And for those who would not, you remember Jesus' instruction to them? He instructed his followers to shake off the dust of their feet as a testimony to their rejectors and to be able to move on down the road. Now, today's passage actually begins with a story not about John the Baptist, nor even about Herod Antipas. But today's story is about Jesus and about what people thought of him. I mean, it's all about Jesus, am I right? 
And what we think of Jesus will directly impact our lives. Whether our thoughts are about him are positive or negative, Jesus impacts who we are and who we become and who Jesus is to us determines our eternal destiny. Now that is the message that John the Baptist preached as well as all of the followers of Jesus. Bible commentaries have actually said that our passage today was a, was a sort of an interlude that Mark uh, takes from the, the course of his gospel or that, it, that this narrative of Jesus is somehow interrupted by the telling of the, uh, the story of the death of John the Baptist and how he died at the hands of Herod. Not at all is this an interlude or an interruption. Friends, I believe it couldn't be any more intentional to accentuate what Mark has taught us in the previous 13 verses. So for Mark chapter 6, uh, verses 14 to 29, my message today called Haunted Conscience it, it, it does tell the story of John the Baptist and how he was killed and, and what prompted Herod to execute him. But my friends, listen, we can't miss what put John uh, in Herod's hands in the first place. Yes, this is about Jesus. This is about the gospel message. So I invite you to take a look at it together with me as we discover what the Holy Spirit wants to reveal to us this morning. So with your Bibles open to Mark chapter 6, let's begin reading at uh, verse 14. I'm going to ask, invite you to stand with me to honor the reading of God's Word. As uh, usual, for, for those of you especially who are our guests I'm reading from the ESV English Standard Version. I welcome you to uh, read from whatever is your uh, preference uh, in Bible translations. King Herod heard of it, for Jesus' name had become known. Some said John the Baptist has been raised from the dead. That is why these miraculous powers are at work in him. But others said, he is Elijah. And others said, he is a prophet like one of the prophets of old. But when Herod heard of it, he said, John, whom I beheaded, has been raised. For it was Herod who had sent and seized John and bound him in prison for the sake of Herodias, his, brother's, uh, his brother Philip's wife, because he had married her. For John had been saying to Herod, it is not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. And Herodias had a grudge against him and wanted to put him to death. But she could not, for John fe excuse me, for Herod feared John, knowing that he was a righteous and holy man, and he kept him safe. When he heard him, he was greatly perplexed, and yet he heard him gladly. But an opportunity came when Herod on his birthday gave a banquet for his nobles and military commanders and the leading men of Galilee. For when Herodias' daughter came in and danced, she pleased Herod and his guests. And the king said to the girl, ask me what, for whatever you wish and I will give it to you. And he vowed to her, whatever you ask me, I will give you up to half of my kingdom. And she went out and said to her mother, for what should I ask? And she said, the head of John the Baptist. And she came in immediately with haste to the king and asked, saying, I want you to give me at once the head of John the Baptist on a platter. And the king was exceedingly sorry. But because of his oaths and his guests, he did not want to break his word to her. And immediately the king sent an executioner with orders to bring John's head. 
he went and beheaded him in the prison and brought his head on a platter and gave it to the girl. And the girl gave it to her mother. And when his disciples heard of it, they came and took his body and laid it in a tomb. Let us pray. Father, I hope that this story is not so familiar that it's just another story. I pray, Lord, that even as we read it today, having read many, uh, read the story many times, we are just plain disgusted, not by the grotesqueness of the beheading of this man, but we just feel, we see, we sense the evil in these people just oozing off the pages. We are incensed by this kind of people. And then we realize, Lord, that some things never change. The gospel is needed more today than ever before. People are evil all throughout. Lord, I pray that by the power of your spirit that you speak to our hearts today, that you would find some openness in our hearts to what is shared today right out of these scriptures. And we sense you moving, but most importantly, Lord, we sense ourselves moving closer to you and closer to the obedience that you, that you call of your followers today. May it be so in Jesus' name, amen, amen. Thank you, church. Please be seated. Church, I want you to please notice the, the timeline structure of today's passage. Then in verses 14 to 16, Mark speaks to the impact that the gospel was having on people around the region as Jesus' disciples were obediently going out and spreading the good news, the gospel, and the word about Jesus that the word had finally reached the ears of Herod Antipas and, and what he heard was a testimony that was so powerful that it frightened him. For Mark writes, for Jesus' name had become known. What are these stories that I hear, he might ask? Who could this Jesus be? Some said, John the Baptist has been raised from the dead. Others said, he is Elijah. Others said, he is a prophet. Herod settled on the, the resurrection of John the Baptist as the answer that he would accept without much persuasion, you see, because this godly man was still on the conscience of the one who had ordered his execution. It's pretty commonplace for people to talk about how little they know. You know, it is even not uncommon for, for me, I think particularly as a pastor to hear, some people are saying about this, that, or the other. You know, so I will usually ask, well, you know, who is it that are saying these things? And all of a sudden, they no longer have any names. So uh, perhaps I will ask, you know, well, how many people are saying these things? One, two, three, a dozen? I mean, for all I know, some people could be just one other person. Seriously, folks, should I, as, even as your pastor, uh, try to lead people or make important decisions over what some people say? Right? I mean, we'd be bouncing off the walls like Super Bowls. Personally, I'm unpersuaded about what some people say. But apparently Herod's conscience was deeply disturbed, even haunted over the things that he had heard about Jesus. 
Jesus' popularity in Palestine was growing by the time we reached Mark chapter 6 here. And everybody was asking, well, who is this guy? A couple chapters later in Mark chapter 8, specifically verses 27 to 30, we read where Jesus is raising the question himself. And Jesus went on with his disciples to the villages of Caesarea Philippi. And on the way, he asked the disciples, well, who do people say I am? What do you think their reply would be? Right? What they told him, well, John the Baptist. Others say Elijah. And others say one of the prophets. So then Jesus asked, well, who do you say I am? And Peter stepped up and answered him, you are the Christ. You are the Messiah. You are the anointed one. Friend, is that your response as well? I mean, who do you say Jesus is? The question of who Jesus is came out of the obedience of his disciples who were going all around the region from town to town unashamedly proclaiming the good news and to preach a message of repentance that leads to salvation. Jesus is the way. Jesus is the truth. And Jesus is the life. And no one comes to God the Father except through him. And it seems the, the townspeople of Nazareth were confused about this message. Herod was surely confused, wasn't he? How about you? Are any of you all here today confused about who Jesus is? So who is Jesus? Was Jesus just a man with, with some good ideas, one of the many spiritual leaders? Was he the true God, the one true mediator, our only source of life and peace with God the Father? It's not enough to know what others say about Jesus. Friend, you must know. You must understand and accept for yourself that he is the Messiah. He is the deliverer of your sins. He is the Lord of your life. Amen. And you must be able to tell others who Jesus is. You must be able to move from curiosity to commitment, from admiration to adoration. How about you? How would you answer this question? Is Jesus, like, like Jody said, is Jesus Lord and Savior? Is it something you proclaim? Now, long before the disciples got it right, Herod Antipas got it wrong. It's John the Baptist, he said. Come back to haunt me. Well, John the Baptizer was a special man, uh, no doubt chosen for a special mission. John was Jesus' cousin. He was chosen by God, even anointed by the Holy Spirit while he was still in his mother's womb to be the forerunner of the Messiah. He was the fulfillment of several Old Testament prophecies, and he was a bold, powerful, and effective preacher. Oh, a true man of God. And as Jesus Christ himself once testified, saying, uh, uh, truly, I, I say to you, among those born of women, there has arisen uh, no one greater than John the Baptist. This idea in, in Herod's head all came about because of his conscience. 
It was haunted over the killing of a, of a man of God. His, his fear was rightfully overtaking him because at the core of who this Herod was, was a hollow, empty man. In verses 17 to 29, they tell the backstory of John's beheading at Herod's orders. Now, we've read the story, so let me provide some even more essential background that helps us to understand this sin, sick, wicked family with perhaps with a, a clearer view and try to comprehend what led to this event. Herod Antipas was a wicked, wicked man who ruled over one-fourth of Palestine at the time of Jesus' ministry. This is how this happened. His father was Herod the Great. You remember Herod great, the Great was the one who ruled at the time of Jesus' birth and had ordered the deaths of all of those infants in Bethlehem in an effort to destroy the Lord Jesus. Why? Well, because some wise men had come to him from the east saying that they were there to worship the king of the Jews. And Herod, the not so great, actually felt threatened by the presence of this infant. So when Herod the Great died, the Roman emperor divided the kingdom into four parts that was each ruled by Herod's four sons. And the part that is given to Herod Antipas to rule was this region of Israel called, uh, excuse me, uh, that included Galilee. Herod wasn't really a king. He was actually what was called a tetrarch, which means a ruler of the fourth part. Actually, Emperor uh, Augustus denied the title of king to Herod. But goaded by Herodias, an ambitious one of his so-called wife, Herod pressed to get the title again and again and over again until he actually came to offend the, the emperor's court and he was dismissed as a traitor. Mark used the title king here in, in this gospel because Herod demanded that all of his subjects call him king. But get this. Herod Antipas ruled from 4 AD to 39 AD when he was banished to what is now France by the Roman emperor for demanding that he be made king in 39 AD. What a loser. What a loser. It gets deeper. Among Herod's half-brothers are Aristobulus, who, by the way, was killed by his own father. He also had another stepbrother named Herod Philip. I'm slowing down a little bit intentionally just to help you follow. All of these step siblings came from Herod the Great, for whom he married five wives and had sons and daughters by all of them. Herod Antipas married the daughter of Aristos I, who was an Arabian king. Herod Philip married Herodias, who is the woman in our text today, who was also the daughter of his half-brother Aristobulus. She was his half-niece. She had a daughter named Salome, who is the girl who's dancing for Herod Antipas in our text. Her double half-uncle and stepfather. So Herod Philip was disinherited by his father, Herod the Great. So he and Herodias moved to Rome. 
Herod Antipas and his wife then decided they'd go visit his brother in Rome, and it was there that Herod Antipas fell in love with Herodias. They both had an affair, and then they left each other's spouses to marry one another. Confused yet? Now, from what you've heard, or from what you think you've heard, is it any wonder that a godly man like John the Baptist, whose calling was to preach repentance, just might call out Herod Antipas for his sick and immoral lifestyle? Oh, yes, and he did. And every time Herod was around, John preached against incest and adultery from God's law. From verse 18, for John had been saying to Herod, it is not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. So when he preached repentance, John didn't spare anyone, no matter who they were. Herod was upset by John's preaching suffering from a guilty conscience and had him thrown into prison. Verse 17, for it was Herod who had sent and seized John and bound him in prison for the sake of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife, because he married her. It seems to me here that Herodias was even more upset even furious for in verse 19, Herodias had a grudge against him and wanted to put him to death. But she could not, for Herod feared John, knowing that he was a righteous and a holy man and he kept him safe. You know, he, he didn't want the, the karma of, of having to kill John. And so when he heard him, uh, Mark writes, he was greatly perplexed, and yet he heard him gladly. Keep that in mind. Now, I'm surely not going to waste any of your time or mine on how Herodias' daughter Salome shamelessly danced before Herod and his special guest trying to win their favor. It is more... I think a detailed demonstration of how deep their sin ran and how dysfunctional and demented their character. Because Herod was afraid to cross his wife or lose face amongst his friends. He did something he knew to be wrong. His conscience would haunt him because he never wanted to be faced with killing John the Baptist. He dreaded the thought of it. But because he had no moral backbone, he submitted to the demand of turning over the head of John the Baptist to save face among his friends who clearly heard his boasting oath. Okay, so this is the past that, that Mark tells to give us some understanding. This is the backstory that leads us to Herod hearing about Jesus and, and uh, do, uh, what he was doing in both word and deed. And immediately John the Baptist came to Herod's mind. The message of repentance. Just as John had been set apart from the rest, this Jesus is not like anyone else. It's all Herod could think about. Herod so regretted killing John, but all along he chose to do what? Suppress his sin. He chose to put it aside, shove it to the back of his mind. He did what so many do and have done. Instead of repent of his sin, he suppressed it. He just 
shoved it out of sight, out of mind until the word of Jesus then brought it to the forefront and Herod could not help but face it. Now, according to gotquestions.org, are y'all familiar with that? Gotquestions.org. I mean, it is really a good resource for finding many of the answers that you might have about your biblical questions. I want to share with you a, a definition that they provide this morning on what conscience is. I quote, the conscience is defined as that part of the human psyche that induces mental anguish and feelings of guilt when we violate it and feelings of pleasure and well-being when our actions, thoughts, or words are in conformity to our value systems. The Greek word translated conscience in all New Testament references means moral awareness or moral consciousness. So I want you to recognize from that that the conscious conscience reacts to one's actions, thoughts, and words conform to or are contrary to a standard of right and wrong. The Apostle Paul writes in Romans 2, verse 15, they show that the work of the law is written on their hearts while their conscience also bears witness and their conflicting thoughts accuse or even excuse them. Paul refers several times in scriptures to having a good or a clear conscience. In 1 Timothy 4.2, Paul also speaks of having a seared conscience. A seared conscience. If the conscience is seared, literally cauterized, then it has been rendered insensitive. Such a conscience does not work properly. It's as if spiritual scar tissue has dulled the sense of right and wrong. Do you hear me on that? That just as the hide of an animal is scarred by a branding iron and it becomes numb to further pain, so the heart of an individual with a seared conscience is desensitized to moral pangs. End quote from Got Questions. The description of a seared conscience here perfectly fits Herodias as Mark wrote about her. Surely she hated John enough to want to kill him. You know, for if he were dead and out of the way, then she could bear to cope with her sin. His presence served as a constant reminder of her immorality. So you see, death was the only solution that she could put, put up with because killing John was just plain all right with her. Her conscience was so seared that nothing could give her greater pleasure than to have John murdered. Now, Herod had some conscience, surely enough for it to be haunted when he heard about Jesus. The similar messages of both John the Baptist and Jesus led Herod to believe that Jesus was John resurrected from the, the, the death that he had ordered. So we ask ourselves this morning, well, how can I get a clear conscience how can I get a clear conscience the conscience of man was awakened when Adam and Eve disobeyed God's command and ate from the free, uh, fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you see because before that they had only known good We can have our consciences cleansed when we bring our sin and our miserable attempts to please God to the foot 
of the cross. The atonement of Christ forgives our sin and cleanses our conscience. Didn't we talk about that with the blood of Jesus today? Do you remember singing? Are you washed in the blood? We acknowledge our inability to cleanse our hearts, our inability to cleanse our hearts and ask Jesus to do it for us. We trust that Christ's death and resurrection are sufficient to pay for the price that we owe God. You know, when we accept Jesus' payment for us, for our personal sin, God promised to cast our sins away from as far as the east is from the west. Repentance isn't a practice that most of us enjoy. Amen? Amen. And certainly it's not something that people even want to be told that they need to do. In a world that cheers personal autonomy and self-expression, the suggestion that someone's way of life is something that needs to be repented of is, is clearly out of bounds. But as Christians, we recognize the call to repentance as the primary part of the gospel. And yes, Jesus orders it. It is only when we repent of our sins, friends, and turn f from those sins and turn to Jesus that we can be forgiven of our sins, have our conscience washed clean and be saved from the wrath of God. John's preaching was repent. For the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And as hundreds came and, and, re, and confessed their sins in preparation of the Messiah's coming, then John would baptize them like you saw today, immersion into the water as a symbol of their desire for a cleansed heart. He, he, he confronted sin and he called for holiness. So how do you respond to the gospel message? Are you more like those who heard John's call to repent of their sins and, and can come and confess it? Or are you more like Herod who would just suppress or even hide their sins out of sight, out of mind? I would suggest today that most of the church is like Herod, or the church would be entirely different. It would be entirely different. So friend, when you confess your sin to Jesus and you ask him for, your, for, for, uh, for his forgiveness, you get your slate, your, all of your sins, past, present, clean, the blood of Jesus washes us clean from our past. Now, I don't always forget my past like I should. I, some, I, I try to allow it to steer me away from, uh, from uh, mistakes, sin of the present. But nevertheless, I'm surely not going to let my past haunt me like, like it did Herod. You know, Jesus' greatest miracle, we've been talking about many here, was what he did for you and me on the cross, taking my sin and your sin upon himself, shedding his blood, and paying my sin debt against God. Not to forget that glorious resurrection from a tomb. Jesus is alive today and he promises forgiveness for those who, who repent of their sins, submit and surrender to his lordship. Amen. Amen. 
Romans, Paul writes in Romans 10, 9, one of my favorites. If you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord. Believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified. It's with your mouth that you confess and are saved. Yeah, you go ahead and plod God's word. It is good. It is good. When a preacher preaches the truth from the Bible, my friends, there, are, there will be times when he gets a little too close to where you're living. And when that happens, you've got several choices. I want to share them with you. First of all, you can ignore the message. Verse 20, for Herod feared John, knowing that he was a righteous and holy man and kept him safe. And when he heard him, he was greatly perplexed and yet even heard him gladly. Oh, that's a, a dangerous place to be, to ignore the message because a haunted conscience can lead to a seared conscience. There are people... Many people like Herod in the world today. That's why they can get away doing with what they do. And, and they get caught up or some in, in the preaching or they get caught up in the personality of the man like Herod had done. But they miss the point of the message. They like to hear their favorite preacher preach. But they have no intentions of ever doing what the Bible instructs them to do. That's a dangerous way to live. When God speaks to your heart, he's extending grace to you that you don't deserve. He's showing you that he cares about you, that he loves you. He's got a better plan for your life. And when he points out your errors from the word of God, he does so because he loves you and he wants to change you. Your second choice is you can attack the preacher, right? Herodias had a grudge against him and wanted to put him to death. That's also dangerous. Would you agree? Because God is going to judge you for that response. Besides, if the preacher is preaching the truth, he's really just delivering the mail. Amen. If you have an issue, take it up with the Lord. Amen. And thirdly, you can bring the need to the Lord. You can let God work in your life to bring, about, bring you about to a place of repentance and blessing. Remember 1 John 1, verses 9 and 10. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and, and just to for, forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. Oh, friends, it's been said that sin will take you farther than you want to go, keep you longer than you want to stay, and cost you far more than you want to pay. Amen. Yeah. This was certainly the case for Herod. His desire for Herodias ultimately led him to an unjust execution of a prophet of God. And in the end, he determined that it was a far, far better option to kill John the Baptist than it was to disappoint his wife and appear indecisive in front of his peers. The guilt over what he did was eating his innards alive. You know, he knew he killed an innocent, decent, and good man. In fact, that's what he confessed right here in the scripture. John, whom I beheaded, has been raised. His conscience haunted him. And he was sure that it was John the Baptist had come back to haunt him. That's how bad his, his conscience was. That is the power of guilt. 
It'll eat you alive, my friends. You can't run from it. You can't hide from it. You can't escape his words. It's going to show up when you're alone. Yes, it is. And, and guilt comes calling in the dead of night. It gnaws at your soul. It eats away at the mind. The only solution for guilt over the past sins is to bring your sins to Jesus at the foot of the cross. And when they're brought to him, Jesus forgives your sin and he removes the guilt. He can set you free from that haunted monster of guilt. Has the Lord Jesus been calling you, my friend, to come to him in salvation? Or, or has he been calling you to get your life right before him and get your spiritual life back or maybe to get a new one in the first place? Has he been calling you to turn away from some sin in your life? No one is exempt from any of those questions. If he is calling you, please don't be like Herod. Please come to Jesus today. Repent of your sin. Surrender to his lordship. The time for obedience, my friend, is when? Now, now, let us pray. Father, we learn much from the Holy One, our Lord Jesus. It's all about Jesus. But help us to learn even from the evil one today and the mistakes that are so devastating Oh, Lord, it's easy to get up and walk away. It's easy to shut off the TV or the radio. It's easy to close the book, all of which the word spoken can convict us of our sin. The Apostle Paul says, how can anyone hear the gospel, the good news, unless it is preached. Lord, I pray for those who are in this room right now, knowing that the word of God lands on each and every one. Lord, I am surely not exempt. Knowing that this word is, is like a seed that's being cast across the internet to all parts of the world who tune in. The call from God's word today. I'm just the postal deliverer. The message is God is good and he loves us. But as we who have turned away from God, his love we have rejected, his good intentions for our life we have rejected because somehow, some way, we think we know better. And that sin has separated us from a right relationship. But thank you, God, that you sent your son, our savior, the Messiah, the, the anointed one, the Christ. To deliver that message once again with the demonstration of love and grace by your death on a cross, your shed blood, your beaten and broken body. But as worst of all, you took what my sin deserved, what all of our sin deserves upon yourself, Lord Jesus. Buried in a tomb, you didn't stay there, but defeated death and the devil, gloriously rose to life everlasting to promise us once and for all if we would come to you and lay their sins at your feet to be forgiven because our penalty is paid for 
to turn away from sin forever and turn to you, Lord Jesus, we'd not only be made uh, uh, clean, our conscience would be cleansed, we'd be given a new life. Father, I pray right now that the conscience of everyone here today is touched in a way, Lord, that draws them closer to you. And for the one who says, I repent of my sin, I turn to you, Lord Jesus, forgive me. I invite you to come into my life and save me of my sins. I give my life to you. I pray, Lord, that you move them to make that final decision and trust in you to work miracles in our lives. I'm trusting in you, Lord Jesus, to speak to us and deliver us to that point. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Saving my soul. Thank you, Lord, for making me whole. Thank you, Lord, for giving to me thy great salvation, so rich and free. Let the church sing. Amen. You're dismissed. Amen.